Who's responsible when citizens of your own country dies by a tragic incident? Today's case is not well known outside of South Korea and hopefully I can shed a little light on the crushing case of the two Korean students by US military tank. In light of the recent Itaewon case and right now, so many people are angry that the government police force, the town leader didn't do enough to prevent such a tragedy. And similar to today's case, till this day, no one was held responsible but but in a case like this, is anyone responsible? This case was so big in South Korea 20 years ago, pretty much now. And in today's video, I have a special interview with an ex-US military veteran who was here when this case was happening and he was in the military base when the riots were happening. So he remembers everything and he gives a little two cents. But let's dive into this dark history because I am also curious about your opinion as well. And just in case you forgot to keep these stories going, your thumbs up, liking this video and subscribing and hitting the notification bell because I reply to all my early words that get to these videos early. With hours and days spending on these videos, I thank so much for today's sponsor, Native, who has continuously been supporting true crime content. And a lot of you guys who have complimented on my pretty pits. Negative is the only deodorant that I actually use. I just love how they're aluminum free and paraben free, vegan and cruelty free, which is so important for me for it to be cruelty free. And the thing about Native is that they have plastic free deodorant packaging. So that is so important. Push it up, fly. I'm good to go. My favorite scent is lilac and white tea. Oh, it just smells very feminine, classy, beautiful. They also have a sensitive range. This one's cotton and lily. Mm, it smells like baby. The sensitive range is baking soda free formula, which is made with coconut oil and magnesium oxide. I love how these are not sticky, dries really quickly. Three plastic free deodorants would be normally $39, but with my link and code down below, you get it for $26, which is 33% off. And plus you get 20% off their other things like body wash, toothpaste. That's a huge discount, so remember to check it out. And thank you so much to Native for always supporting true crime content. And for you guys, just by clicking and checking out today's sponsor really helps me to continue making these videos. I love you guys, and let's get back to the video. It was summer of 2002, June 13th to be exact. And 2002 was a big year, especially for South Korea, as the World Cup was being hosted by South Korea and Japan. Soccer is one of the biggest supports in South Korea. It's kind of comparable to basketball or football in America. I mean, the whole nation comes together when they have something like this. Biggest K-pop stars come to perform. Everybody's drinking and eating after and like you're hugging strangers. I mean, it is just a big festive, like you are my brother, my sister mood. While everybody was in a festive mood in another town the same day, two best friends who was living in Gyeonggi-do province, Hyo Sun and Mi Sun, Hyo and Mi, decided to meet up and walk about 200 meters up the road in their little town to meet with their friends at a small restaurant. They decided to go and hang out in Uijangbu, which is a close by, a bit more populated town. The two friends were only in seventh grade Rage, so that's about 14 years old. And next day, June 14th, was actually Hyo's birthday. So the girls were just so excited. It's World Cup. I mean, they were just so excited to just have a great day. Misan that day was also wearing the red World Cup shirt to support her country. Now, the place that they were living in was a very rural, rural place. It's kind of like where my grandmother lives, where there's like one bus every hour, you know, there's farms, there isn't, like, it's not like a city. They also attended a very small school. There was only 10 graduating students at the time. So Misan and Hyosun were like best friends since they were in elementary school. It's about 10.30 a.m. as they're walking up this road and usually they don't walk. They have their parents drive them or ride the bus. But this particular day, their friend's restaurant was so close that they didn't really have to get a ride. In South Korea, there's several U.S. military bases. And I think by now you guys know the history generally of South Korea. In North Korea, the Korean War happened in 1950s. And basically US, the United States and South Korea has a security arrangement after the Korean War. So technically a combat could break out anytime because there was no peace treaty signed. The US was heavily involved in helping out South Korea during the Korean War. And again, there's a lot of US military bases because it's technically a, still a combat zone. They say there's about up to 73 US FK bases in South Korea and they have drills, practices, and tests going on all the time. Early in the morning at around 
9:20 a.m. On the same day, a base near the town just finished their all-nighter training session and was going back to their unit base. I guess their training location was different from the military base, so they had to move and go back. Now, this particular training was for a counterattack operation using tanks. According to the soldiers, this was about two night, three days drill. And within those three days, the maximum amount of sleep they got was five hours. So these soldiers were very tired. And you know, when you're using a lot of body energy doing training and you get only five hours of sleep within three days, your brain and mind and sight is probably not working to its fullest condition. On this particular day, almost all military vehicles, and this included what we commonly know as tanks, but basically about up to seven vehicles were to drive back to the base. Apparently this was a sudden decision. All the soldiers knew that day, that morning, that these vehicles had to come back to the military base. Usually there's apparently notices beforehand, but this day, they just all decided like we have to move back the vehicles. So because it was such a sudden decision, no one around the area, the town, nobody was alerted. So Mr. K, he has drove these tanks before and he gives a little bit of insight what it feels like to drive one of these. All right, well, thank you so much for the interview. Um, could you just talk about your time in Korea during this time? I joined the military about a year before that. So I was still uh, pretty low rank. I was just a private, but I was uh, a Bradley driver um, at the time. So I, I used to, drive vehicles like that no that specific tank i know that it's uh, pretty wide it's too wide to fit on one lane highways and half of the vehicle was off the road because you obviously couldn't drive farther on the left side or you'd hit uh, oncoming traffic mm. of course it was normal for us to get very little sleep because we had to practice real world situations sometimes driving eight to twelve hours straight and small confined space like that you're gonna get complacent too i mean now again on top of that on this particular day there was more military tanks coming from the opposite direction from the military base back to this training camp so now you have big military armed vehicles going from both sides of this road the width of one side of the road is 3.3 meters and the tank itself has 3.65 meters in width so it exceeds maximum width of one side of the road now usually the tanks would go over the yellow line that separates the other side of the road but now you have more tanks coming from the opposite side with no room to spare and now this road is going to be completely filled or congested not to mention the tanks were going at around approximately 40 kilometers or around 25 miles per hour which may seem slow but think about 25 miles per hour with a huge military tank now these tanks weigh over 50 tons actually approximately 55 tons which equals to about 110 thousand pounds for one tank, that's impressive. And you said that you drove it once. What is it like inside? No, I didn't drive it once. I drove it many times. Um, and it depended on the exercise. Sometimes we'd actually drive with the hatch down, which makes visibility almost little to nothing. All you can see is like in front of you and maybe like 30 meters away and farther, but you can't see anything up close and personal. Like, mm -hmm. 10, 20 feet, you, if someone was in front of you, there's no way you can see it. You have to actually completely rely on people getting out of the way. It was actually, if anything, it was really scary as a driver at times, uh, especially when the hatch is down, because you don't know what if you're what you're hitting or about to hit or if you're running somebody over. That could have easily been me that did that. The road they were going to use was a bit of a roller coaster. Sometimes it goes downhill and then it just goes up. There's a lot of curves. And because of the curves as well, you might get limited distance. And it was this exact curve that was going to cause a tragedy. The tanks coming back to the military base noticed that there was tanks coming from the other side of the road and there's not enough room on this road. So what they did was swerve a little to their right side as they swerved just tiny bit to make room for the other side of the tanks. This is when the girls were tragically crushed by the tank. Their whole body just rammed by 55 ton, 110,000 pound Wait. They both died on scene and their photos were taken and spread online later. This happened so fast and apparently the nearby farmers and residents there heard something, heard some yelling. So they went to see what was going on and noticed these US military soldiers crowded behind these two 
Korean girls lying dead. Mi was lying completely flat, her head up, her body up. Kyo had her face to the side, trying to kind of flee. And the autopsy shows that the cause of death was their skull just crushed. And so till this day though, it's a real mystery of how everything exactly went down. How did these military personnel not see these civilians? And why did these girls not flee? Why did they wait till they were right in front of the tanks as well? Did they not hear anything? Did they not see anyone? Why didn't they move away? Prior to seeing the tanks, it was a true mystery of cracking down what happened exactly in those moments. Now there are several different versions of the tanks. I believe I believe the one that actually crushed these two girls was this one. There's two people in these tanks, first of all. There's one driver who is pretty much inside of the tanks. And there's a second person who is surveilling seeing and telling the driver where to go. And they're communicating by these, they call it the comm, radio, whatever you call it. They're communicating because it is so loud inside of these tanks apparently. So we go into the investigation. The two soldiers who were in charge of this tank was driver Mark Walker and the person outside telling the driver where to go surveillancing was Fernando Nino. As they were investigating again, they were alerted that day that they were going to move all these vehicles. And apparently there's a commander officer, Mr. Mason. I guess he is someone that is in charge with, you know, giving orders to everybody. Decided to take the shorter, narrower road because it was faster. But this wasn't uncommon. They used these roads a lot of the times, so it wasn't anything new. On top of that, there were two regular vehicles pretty much leading these tanks back to the military base. So on their left side, there was total seven vehicles moving. And according to the investigation, they were alerted, they were radioed in that there were two civilians that they were going to come across. On the other side of the road, those tank other tanks coming in also kind of let the tanks know by hand gestures that there were possible civilians. But the two soldiers inside the first tank says that by the time that they saw these girls and the sign, it was too late to stop the car. And this is the mysterious part, but in the investigation, according to the US military and the soldiers, they claimed that the radios were partially broken and they did not hear the three previous warnings, did hear the fourth one, but it was too late by then. But isn't that why you guys have a second guy kind of surveilling? So what is that like? Yeah, they're, they're called tank commanders. They're the ones in the turrets usually, or uh, the guys that are standing up top and like uh, looking but I mean, uh, we were still using old uh, equipment, and I heard that the the military reports that they were having comms issues, which does have is a quite normal thing to happen. Couldn't really talk to each other over the radio sometimes, like I don't know, batteries uh, they're on the wrong frequency or um, cables get loose. Because like I said, it was all it wasn't like new equipment that we were using during that time. It was all mm -hmm. old stuff, like 20, 30 years. Now, when I was kind of listening to this, I mean. I thought, okay, tanks, that's the second problem. Well, how about the first two vehicles? Why didn't they stop? Or and on top of that, because they got to the curve, it gave them limited sight and distance. And there was just poor communication from everybody. And this is what led to this tragedy. According to Fernando, who was in charge of surveillance thing, he was outside of the tank. He says that he did see the girls at around 30 meters away, which is about 32 yards away, but couldn't properly warn the driver. So a lot of people were thinking, well, can't you reach, tap the person, say, yo, stop. In this case, when the radio or the comm was broken, what would you have done? Like, could you tap the other person? Is that possible? The, the only thing is like maybe last minute, the tank commander could have like jumped out while the vehicle was still moving, which would have put his life in danger too, but maybe jump out and like bang on the hatch. But even then, you might not even know someone's banging on the hatch. Cause like I said, as a driver, it's really loud in there. A lot of noise, a lot of banging around. We were going on convoys all the time on the road and civilians usually knew to just get out of the way. And that could have also been a, Another reason why they were a little more laid back on protocol and procedures. On the families of Hyo and Mi argued that this may not be a malicious intent or malicious murder, but because they knew that the tanks were bigger than the roadside itself. Knowing that there were other tanks coming from the opposite direction, this accident is a foreseen event that could have been well prevented. Therefore, it should be considered somewhere along with murder.
So after this, the military base commander did offer an apology, but because the World Cup news was just so big, the news only made it to like small little tiny section. The families were given a total of around $200,000 each as a compensation by the US military. But here is where things get a little heated and controversial. The families of course wanted someone responsible, someone to take the blame. I mean, think about it. When someone in your family dies in a tragic accident and nobody is responsible, nobody is taking the blame for, it is so understandable that the families are going to feel unjust. So the family decided to report the case to the Korean police and on July 10th, the Korean police would formally ask the US military, USFK, to give up their rights to the investigation and turn it over to the Korean police. In cases like this where US military is involved and they do something in a foreign country, usually any criminal trials or investigations would happen within the US military courts. If they give up their rights of investigation and judge to the Korean police, they have no say at all. The US military denied this request, so any judgment investigations would happen within the US military court. The US argued that this happened during the US military training to US soldiers, so they had the right to take this to their court. Uh, of course, if you give it to the Korean side, then you're leaving the fate up to the Korean laws. The trial began and they decided to charge only the two soldiers in the tank. In my personal opinion, I feel like there were supposed to be more people that should have been involved, not just these two people in the side of the tank. Like who's the commander officer in charge of everything? I mean, these are probably just regular soldiers that was just doing what they were told. So there is definitely someone higher up who also should have been investigated or at least go through the court. It seems like they were just putting all the blame on these two soldiers that was driving the tank. In the military courts, the two were acquitted found not guilty of negligent manslaughter and was released. The judge ruled that Mark couldn't have seen the girls since he was the one driving, and Fernando and Mark's radios were both broken. There was no way of signaling to the driver that there were civilians coming their way in time. Still a mystery of within that couple of seconds of when Fernando did see the girls, he did admit that he saw the girls at least 30 meters away and why he didn't do anything else to try and stop the tanks. Five days after the verdict, the two soldiers left Korea for good. And Mark, who was the driver, says that he does have a great sadness and guilt for what happened that day and developed PTSD because of it. And the last update from Fernando, which was about 2005, 2006, which was a long time ago, that he was a prison guard. And apparently they asked to interview him and he asked for compensation. Just a rumor, not sure if that's true, but you know, Korea was once again shocked because of that. I'm not saying it's uh, the women's fault that guy ran over, but most of the time people, did, you know, they get out of the way on their own. Mm. Now it's still up to uh, the military units to, you know, be aware of any possible civilians on the road. And I think that's more of a chain of command thing because as far as like a, a tank driver, soldiers are taught to follow orders. And as, as, a, as a driver, you don't stop unless you're told to stop. And if that never happened or if that was never relayed to him, mm. there's, uh, there's no way that's his fault. You know, the communications officers, they should have made sure that communication was working because if the comms went out, then how is it? They're, you know, those two people's fault, right? So the verdict outraged a lot of people. Not only the parents, but now you have like so many people, thousands and thousands of people angry at the verdict, angry at US. From a mass vigil, it turned to an anti-US protest. As you could see, there's people ripping the US flag apart, telling the US military to get out of Korea, and ask George Bush to apologize on behalf, and even a song called Effing USA was released. Shortly after, then US President George Bush did send a message to Korea that he is deeply saddened by the situation, but I think the people of Korea wanted to hear it was our fault. I'm sorry, but that didn't happen. This question is, I know you said you were also at the riots. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, after that happened, uh, Camp Red Cloud over by the Lijanggu area and Camp Casey over by Dongdechan, they thousands of uh, civilians rioting, but it was mostly like college kids and uh, high school kids, to be mm. honest. We had to just always stand by. They would throw stuff at us and like mm. throw signs over the walls. Yeah, we were on lockdown for like two months. We couldn't even leave base. 
Everybody felt bad for what happened, but there wasn't. There's not a single person that I know of during that time that I was stationed with that felt like it was the soldiers' fault. Like you know, we're we're just trying to follow orders, and based on like the. Incident reports and the media. It could have been any of us that ran over those girls.、Um, I know you said somehow the riots stopped. What made the riots finally kind of quiet down? I thought that was like actually pretty interesting that、uh, the Korean media didn't cover that part. After about two months, a bunch of、uh, older Korean guys in black suits like showed up, and a bunch of more like elderly Koreans were you know yelling at them, telling them like, "Hey, get the hell out of here! Like you guys don't know what you're doing. You should be lucky that the U.S. soldiers." Are here. A lot of the older Koreans that are, were around during World War II and the Japanese occupation, and and、uh, during the Korean War, they 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 know that you know South Korea wouldn't be South Korea with. If America didn't get involved, most of the hate that we got was,、uh, you know, the younger generation、mm. of Koreans that wasn't was not alive at the time of the Korean War and World War Two. Anybody that knows about the Korean War, like as soon as the、uh, U.S. military pulled out, that's when North Korea attacked.、Mm -hmm. And the Korean War never ended. It's just an armistice. And this is the reason why it's still the most heavily guarded border in the entire world. So people wondered if there was a faulty radio system. Why didn't they pre-check it before they left? Why did they leave with a faulty radio system? Because that could be very dangerous. Now, according to what I've read, these M60 AVLM tanks, contrary to what civilians think, these are extremely difficult to operate. Apparently, they run into poles all the time. They run over cars. Now the question relies also to the girls. What are the girls thinking? I mean, in a way, we can only guess because they're not here. But what people guess happened in girls' mind was that these are, you know, young fourteen-year-olds, and they lived in this town where the military vehicles and things were happening all the time. So they probably thought, like in other times, military vehicles would swerve, or at least, you know, they would have enough room to get out of the way. There are some witnesses saying that the girls were covering their ears, and you know. Kind of putting their heads down, which absolutely could have happened because the tanks are so loud. Not to mention that they were in a curve, and their probably sight was a little bit limited as well. Is the tank loud? Oh yeah, it's loud. Like if, if someone was outside yelling or anything, you wouldn't hear them because you have your headsets on, and、um, even inside the tank, it's really loud. And you're even with the hatch. Up, even with the hatch up, you're still sitting so far inside the, you know, the vehicle that you really can't see anything immediately in front of you, only far away. Right, Hopefully,、okay. that gives you some clarity on what happened. Yes, thank you so much. And it's so tricky. And I guess, in my personal opinion, seeing the story from you know just researching the case, it is very difficult to point the blame on one person.、Uh, my personal opinion, whoever was in charge should have been definitely penalized. Number one, safety measures should have been put in place no matter what. And things like this is also being talked about recently with the Itaewon incident, where again within that incident, it was technically an unofficial event, and that's why the police. Police and the government are claiming that there was no protocols because you know it wasn't an event. The town, the police knew that there were going to be so many people. Why didn't they provide enough protection prior? But at the end of the day, is it fair or is it possible to blame one person? Or are we just trying to witch hunt and find someone to blame for? As you guys have heard about the military's side into this, and the people side and the family side, what do you think should have happened to the fate of some of these soldiers that were charged? Was it okay to have not guilty verdict? Should someone else have been at fault, or was this something that just truly tragically happened and and it was an honest mistake? Thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much to Mr. K for the special interview, and remember to go check out Native to support this channel. See you in my next video.